Thank you. being seated right there, would you just close your eyes with me and just lift your hands out in front of you? Come on, let's just pray right now. God, we thank you for your presence. Come on, just pray. God, we thank you for your presence that is in this place. God, we thank you that your spirit is real, that you are real, God, and that you are here, that you are in this place, that your triumphal in- entry wasn't just some thousand, two thousand years ago, but you have triumphantly made your way into this place today. God, you have gloriously made your way into every heart, and into every spirit, into this place today. God, and right now we push aside every distraction. We push aside every hindrance, God, that would keep us from you. And we say, do whatever you want to do in our hearts today, God. Do whatever you want to do in our spirits today, God. We love you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. Amen. Come on, everybody say amen. Amen. Man, I love the freedom that's in this place today. We need more of that. Come on, if there's anything we need, we need more of that. We need more of the dancing. We need more of the jumping. We need more of the shouting because, the, because of our, our sense of, man, I like this style and I like that style and I'm conservative and I'm, I'm, I'm man, I'm just chill. And I just like to kind of chill in his presence. What's happened is we've, we've slid into a, a place where Jesus isn't as big of a deal as he should be. But I declare to you in this place, and this is what I've been declaring to our youth group for the last two weeks, is that we will never allow Jesus to not be a big deal in this place. In this group of people, in this company of people, Jesus will always be a big deal. Amen? And this is the week, church, for you to make Jesus the biggest deal that he has ever been in your life. This is the week, and, and I believe that this is the day. I just want to talk to you for just a few moments, and then I'm going to show you a video clip, and man, then we're just going to come right back to where we were, giving Jesus our worship, giving Jesus our praise, because I really believe that we need a love breakthrough. We need a, a love breakthrough, not, not that we love one another, because you can't love one another, you can't love yourself until first you love Jesus. And I think we have to step into a place where we love Jesus like we've never loved Jesus before. Where we love Jesus so much that when you're tired and you don't want to get up in the morning to pray, you say, you know what, even though I'm tired, I'm still going to go pray because I love Jesus. I'm willing to go to church at at, at 5.30 on a Tuesday morning, even though i got to drive all the way across town because I want to pray and I want to press in because I love Jesus. I'm willing to dance even though I don't have any rhythm and I'm a white boy because I love Jesus. I'm willing to make a fool of myself because I love Jesus. And there is, there is reservation. There is lack of worship because there's a lack of love sometimes. And if we want to see, though, a breakthrough in the place of love, we have to see a breakthrough in the place of worship. Because worship is where you fall in love with Jesus. Worship is where you see him face to face. Worship is where you fall in love with Jesus. And I remember, man, I've grown up in church my whole life. I was in church in the womb, man. <laughs> you know, I, I remember loving Jesus my whole life, but I, I had an experience and I had an encounter when I was 15 years old when I went to this place called The Ramp, man. And like, I saw all these people worshiping Jesus and they were dancing and they were shouting and they were running around the room. And I was back there doing my cool guy worship Jesus thing. Like, I love you, Jesus. You know, occasionally give it the two hand. You know, it got really intense. I would do the rock side to side, you know. And then I saw these people and they were doing this like old school gospel soul train thing around the room where they were like doing a Jericho march. And I was like, man, you people are weird. That's crazy. Like I can worship Jesus just fine, just like this. But sometimes church, you have to break out of your own mentality. Sometimes you have to say, you know what? I don't care what you think about me and I don't care what you think about me. I may look like an idiot and I may feel like a fool, but Jesus is worth my worship. Jesus is worth my dance. Jesus is worth my praise. Jesus is the biggest deal. And on this day, several thousand years ago, Jesus made his way into a city declaring, I'm about to do what I came to do. See, usually when Jesus went places, he went incognito. He kind of slid under the radar because 
I mean, he did so many incredible things that the paparazzi had nothing on the followers that tried to follow Jesus. You know, he couldn't, he had to sneak away to find a place just to pray. He had to get up in the middle of the night before everybody else woke up just to get away. And sometimes in life, we feel like that, right? I mean, anybody else have a crazy week last week where you just felt like you didn't even have time to do anything? Jesus had to sneak, you know? He had to just kind of keep it under the radar until he said, it's time. It's time for me to do what I came here to do. And so the Bible says in Matthew, actually all the gospels record this story of Palm Sunday. It says, as Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethpage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village there, he said. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks you what you are doing, just say the Lord needs him, and he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and all the people around him were shouting, Praise God, the Son of David! Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Praise God in highest heaven! The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this, they asked. And the crowds replied, it's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the entry of our Savior. This is the entry when, when Jesus, this is, scholars believe, five days before he would go to the cross. And we call this in the church world, Passion Sunday. And I think today we can feel passion in this place. Can anybody else feel passion in this place? Today we call this Passion Sunday. And then the consecutive days between now and next week being Easter, we call Holy Week. And my challenge to you as a church today is let's get some passion today. Then let's let this week be Holy Week in our lives where we see God every day like we've never seen him before. What if this week you experienced God on a daily basis like you had never experienced him before? What if today, through anything and everything that's happening here, you stepped into a new place of passion in response to what Jesus did? And then this week, you experienced him like you've never experienced him before. I believe right now that God is really just drawing people to him because nearness to him is what he desires from you. And there, there are so many of us today sitting in this place. We come from different backgrounds. We come from different experiences. We come from different cultural things. We come from even different ethnic backgrounds. I love the diversity of this place. But the truth of the matter is, if we were to pass this microphone around today and, and share our testimony, share where we've come from, come where, where we've been, what, what really what God has delivered us from, I think sometimes we would be a little bit shocked. And, and what happens though is that the enemy is so good at doing whatever he has to do to keep us from nearness to God. Nearness to God is what Jesus paid for on the cross, church. And if, and if the enemy can do anything to keep you from stepping into nearness to God, he will do that thing. Usually how he does that is he says to you, remember what you did three days ago? You can't come near to God. Remember what you did in 1973? You can't come near to God. Remember how bad you were before you got saved? And then you came to the cross and you got saved and you thought it was all going to be good, but then you still struggle because you still struggle. You can't come to God. But what Jesus did on the cross church is the greatest thing the world has ever known. What Jesus did on the cross transforms our lives. And I think what the enemy wants to do in our culture today is make what Jesus did on the cross not that big of a deal. 
But if there's anything I want to communicate to us today is that Jesus is the biggest deal. And what he did on that cross is the biggest deal. If you ever find your pla- y- yourself in a mode of complacency, come back to the cross. If you ever find your heart in a place of being cold and lukewarm, come back to the cross and see him, see his nail-scarred hands, see him ripped limb from limb and say, Jesus did that for me. He did that for me when I didn't deserve it. When I could never have earned it, he did that for me and he made a way for me to enter the holy place. As they came in, As Jesus came into the city, I find it interesting. The Bible says that the city was in an uproar. It's time for our city to be in an uproar again because our King has come. It's time for you as an individual to be in an uproar because of what Jesus has done. You have to daily find yourself at the foot of the cross and say, the only proper response when Jesus enters is throw down my crown, take my robe off and throw it down and let him walk across and say, Hosanna, Hosanna to the king. You know what the shouts Hosanna mean when you translate them from the Greek? It means save me now. So when Jesus entered the city, they were singing Hosanna, not even really fully understanding what he was gonna do in just a matter of days. But they were declaring without even knowing it, this is my Savior. They're singing, they're shouting, save me now. Save me now. And then they took branches, the Bible says, palm branches. They put them down. You know what the palm branches represent? They symbolize goodness and victory. And so today on Palm Sunday, what we are declaring is save me now because of your goodness and because of your victory. Save me now because you are good and you are victorious. You are good and you are victorious. This is our week to announce to the world the goodness of our King. This is what Matthew Henry's commentary says about this portion of scripture. It says, when a King comes, something great and magnificent is expected, especially when he comes to take possession of his kingdom. The king, the Lord of hosts, was seen upon a throne high and lifted up in Isaiah chapter 6. But there's nothing of that here. Behold, he cometh to thee, meek and sitting upon a donkey. When Christ would appear in his glory, it is in his meekness, not in his majesty. Listen to this. His temper is very mild. He comes not in wrath to take vengeance, but in mercy to work salvation. He is meek to suffer the greatest injuries and indignities for Zion's access. Easy to be entreated. He is meek, not only as a teacher, but as a ruler. He rules by his love. His government is mild and gentle, and his law is not written in the blood of his subject, but of his own. His yoke is easy. Yesterday, had a full day, really had a full week. I know you guys have all had the same thing. You know, I'm preaching to the choir. I had about 30 minutes to go home and kind of regroup before we came up here for set up and all that kind of stuff. And really just been meditating on, God, what do you want to say to us this week? Lord, what do you want to do? Because we don't, we don't get up here and speak just to preach a message, church. We get up here to communicate to you what we are hearing from the heart of God to just present to you, man, this is what God is saying to us right now. And I went home for just a minute and Whitney was gone working and I was there for just a moment of just kind of silence and solidarity and, and I began to look for some things that I wanted to share with you today and, and, I, and I came across this video clip. It's about a seven minute video clip. We're gonna show it to you here in a moment and I know you can concentrate for seven minutes because you can scroll through Facebook for about 30. So I know you can concentrate. I began to watch this video, and at first I was like, man, this is really good. And then it got a few more minutes in, and I was like, man, this is really good. And a few more minutes in, I caught myself. Nobody else in the house, just me and Jesus. And I just started to weep, thinking about his goodness, thinking about his mercy, thinking about his grace, 
thinking about what he has done for you and for me because he loves us, because he wants us to be near to him. And the enemy is so good at pointing out our failures, pointing out our mistakes. The Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren because he wants to tell you you're not good enough to come near to him. You better fix yourself before you approach this king. You better get it together before you come to the cross. When Jesus says, no, I want to take you just as you are. And I want you to come to the feet of this cross. And I want you to just let my blood wash over you. The Bible says, while we were still sinners, while we were still sinners, while we were in the very act he died for us. He chose us, knowing that we may never even choose Him. He chose us. And today, before this week of Easter, I know next week is the day of salvation and when He died on the cross, but what if we could get, what if we could just get it today? What if we could just come to the altar and get saved all over again today? What if we could just come to the foot of the cross and say, thank you, Jesus, and get our passion back today? And on this day of the triumphal entry, say thank you for what you've done for me, Jesus. And then let this week be a week of devotion and a week of consecration and a week of passion and a week of intimacy with Jesus like you have never known before. We're going on a retreat with our youth Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and I believe that we're going to experience the goodness and the glory and the presence of God like we never have before. And I believe for you this week, this is going to be the most intense spiritual week you've ever had if you choose to press into Jesus. I'm going to show you this clip, and it just communicates to us our need for the cross, our need to remember what Jesus has done for us. It's so easy even for us. We catch ourselves pointing the finger sometimes at someone who we think is so wrong, even in culture. You know, we read news articles like that guy, you know, raped that person or committed murder. And we're like, man, that guy's so bad. And Jesus is saying, I died for that one. I died for that one, man. And today, as we reflect on Jesus making his entry, saying, I'm the king who comes to save. Today, we're going to declare, save me now by your goodness and by your victory because he has won the victory church. There is no temporary season of sin that can trump the eternal act that he did on the cross. And so today what I wanna to communicate to you is that he paid for us to come with confidence into his presence. Some of you were reserved when, when people were up here dancing because you thought somewhere deep down inside, I can't dance like that because I'm not worthy. He paid for you to dance like that. He paid for you to shout like that. He paid for you to come confidently into his presence. Let's watch this clip. Do your best to stay focused and then we're just gonna come straight to the altar or read one more scripture after this. But focus, open your heart, let this go deep. I believe it's gonna move you today. We see the story of Jesus going to the cross and everything seems to kind of be hand in hand. And then there's this one character that seems to interrupt the narrative. His name's Barabbas. We don't even know much about him except that he's a murderer, a leader of an insurrection, a rebel. And why he's even mentioned, sometimes I'm not so sure. It's like, what? Let's, this is about Jesus going to the cross. So in this moment, Pilate thinks, I hold the destinies of these two men in my hand. I know the Jews have a tradition that on a holy day, I will release one of the prisoners on death row. Pilate stands on this audacious stage who now presents Jesus, son of the living God, versus Barabbas, the thug and rebel. He says, all right, who do you want? This is blasphemy. This is, this has gone too far. There's no comparison. This is a rightful prisoner, a man who should be on death row. He's a rebel against Rome. He leads a rebellion. He murders people. He's a bad man. He's a thug and he's a crook. 
He deserves the chains and He deserves the crucifixion. Jesus, what has He done but heal, restore, deliver, set free, open blind eyes, open deaf ears, heal the lame and the leper. What, what has Jesus done? Who do you want? We, we want Barabbas. Yeah, give us Barabbas. People say, give us Barabbas. The Roman soldiers come up and they put the key in and they unlock Barabbas from his chains and shackles. And he walks down the platform, welcomed by all of his thug friends. Yeah, the people love me. Yeah, that's right. I don't even know who this Jesus guy is, but all I know is my people love me. There seems to be no conscience in Barabbas. There's no record of him turning to Jesus and saying, I owe you everything now, for you have set me free. No, I don't see any of that in Barabbas. God knew that. Jesus stood there, silent for he knew the will of the Father. He said, it's fine, Father. Let him have Barabbas. For Jesus knew that the Father would have to treat Jesus like Barabbas so he could treat Barabbas like Jesus. Barabbas thought it was the people that set him free. No, 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 no. It was the love of the Heavenly Father. gospel are you bound are you held under the power of this temptation this sin the sexual urges do you feel like it's controlling you what are you gonna do I'm gonna shake myself free stop it no you won't you're no match for the powers of hell and the urges of sin and sexual temptation you will not overcome it and you will never overcome it. You'll just be another statistic. There's no answer within yourself. Your own marriage, your own goodness, your own discipline, your own devotion will not save your marriage and will not save your kids. There's only one. And he's the one that took your place. He's the one that stood silently on the platform with Pilate and said, yes, let him have Barabbas. Take me. How many times have I stood on that platform with Pilate and Jesus and I'm the Barabbas and they start to take my chains off and I say, no, no, I deserve this. I deserve the guilt. I deserve the shame. I deserve the consequence. I deserve it. Jesus seems to look at me and say, no, son, let me have it. Let me have your sin. Let me have your pain. No, God, I did it to myself. I deserve it. My marriage won't make it. This is what I deserve. I deserve divorce. I deserve poverty. I deserve sickness. I deserve it all. No. God, I say, I'm so ashamed. Give me your shame. But God, what if I do it again? I'll still be here. Oh 
God, I don't want to hurt you. I love you. I, I don't want to do this anymore. Give me your sins. This is all we got. It's all I got. It's all you got. We can play games. We can play church games. We can pretend like some people are better than others and that's why they're blessed. Or we can all come to the honest conclusion that it's God. And it's God alone. The greatest challenge is not your discipline, your devotion, your focus. Your greatest challenge is believing the gospel. Could it be that there's a God with a love so scandalous, so wide, so deep, so vast, so high, so expansive, so welcoming, so inclusive? Let me have your sin, son. Okay. And I give him my sin. Let's stand in this empty space of forgiveness and acceptance while Jesus walks off to the cross that I deserve. I see him, I see him walking to the post to be whipped. As I stand a free man, all the attention is turned now. And I feel the love of God saying, Go, son, live your life. I'll pay the price. Where did we get off thinking that we were going to set ourselves free? It's still Jesus. It'll always be Jesus. It'll never stop being the power of Jesus. If His blood is sufficient for your salvation, His blood is sufficient to sustain you through every challenge and every sin and every temptation. Jesus is enough. Come on, just lift your hands right where you're at. Come on, this is the Jesus that we are announcing today. This is the Jesus that we are announcing is here. This is our Jesus who we're saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to God in the highest. This is our Savior. This is our Jesus. This is the one who is nailed on the cross for us. Today, this is what I want to say to you in Hebrews. It says, so friends, we can now, without hesitation, walk right up to God into the holy place. Jesus has cleared the way by the blood of his sacrifice, acting as our priest before God. The curtain into God's presence is his body. It says then, so let's do it full of belief, confident that we are presentable inside and out. Let's keep a firm grip on his promises because he always keeps his word. Just close your eyes and just feel the love of God in this place. The way I want to do this today, I just want to say that if you find yourself today on this Passion Sunday, just needing more of Jesus, just needing to find yourself at the foot of the cross and say, thank you for the cross. Thank you for your blood that was shed for me. Today, God, I want to receive that all over again. Today, I want to receive that mercy and that grace and that goodness all over again where there have been things that, that I've believed that had the potential to hold me back. Today, church, no, there is nothing that can hold you back from Him. Today, we are announcing that by His goodness and by His victory, He has won for us. And if you find yourself today just needing that injection of passion, just needing to find yourself at the foot of the cross, I'm going to count to three, and I feel like we should come to this altar and kneel and pray and just receive the love of God. If that's you today, you say, I want to have more passion. I want to receive the blood of Jesus. I want to find myself at the foot of the cross. When I count to three, I just want you to move from your seat and just fill this altar. Come on, church, if that's you, one, two, three. Come on, just get up and come to this place and find yourself at the foot of the cross. And let's worship our Savior today and thank him for his goodness thank him for his grace thank him for his mercy oh we thank you Jesus we thank you Jesus we thank
thank you, Jesus. Woman, if you're in this place today and you felt like there are things that are keeping you, that you feel unworthy, you feel like you can't come boldly into his throne, church today, he died for you. We thank you for the cross, Jesus.